Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Linda Hallman. I'm the executive director and CEO of AAUW, the American Association of University Women. And we're delighted to have you here for this uh, interesting and topical uh, discussion. So Slut Walk DC may be over, but the conversation certainly isn't. And we're pleased to provide a forum where interested parties can hash out the event, its purpose, and try to determine what, if anything, was achieved. The Slut Walk started in Toronto in April in response to a police officer who said women shouldn't be or wouldn't be victimized if they didn't dress like sluts. That first walk in Toronto touched a nerve and people around the world from Des Moines, Iowa to Delhi, India are organizing and participating in satellite slut walks to say that sexual assault is about power, not our clothing choices. Slut walkers also challenge the negative connotation of the word slut. Every two minutes, someone in the US is sexually assaulted. This is a major issue for young people in particular, since nearly half of the victims are under the age of 18 and 80% are under age 30. Unlike the stereotypical stranger in the bushes rape, about 67% of the assaults are committed by people the person knows. In part because of the fear of being blamed for somehow causing or inviting the assault, 60% of sexual assaults are never reported to the police. Similarly, 15 out of 16 rapists will never spend a day in jail, and often rapists are repeat offenders. Did you get that? 15 <laughs> out of 16 will never spend a day in jail. Despite decades of activism from the women's community to change this attitude, even today, victim blaming is common when it comes to the crimes of sexual assault and rape. One young woman who spoke at Slut Walk DC and shared her experience reporting a sexual assault said the police officer asked her multiple times what she had on, what she was wearing. Interestingly, in a study of convicted rapists, nearly none of them could recall what their victim was wearing. Raising awareness about these alarming facts and working to prevent sexual assault are goals shared by people across the country particularly in the women's movement and community. There are few people then who question the need for the goal of slut walks, but there are plenty of questions about the methods, success rates, and the headline grabbing name. So historically, many organizations have resorted to incendiary language and visuals in demonstrations to highlight their own causes. Uh, pictures of fetuses uh, outside abortion clinics and, clinics and paint bombs thrown on furs uh, come immediately to mind. These actions do throw a spotlight on the issues, but many moderates or many, some people feel that these measures hurt the cause rather than help. And, how, and some others also point out that without extremism, no center ground can be reached. There's a pendulum that swings, and sometimes it has to swing both ways before you find some common ground. So they count on the visuals and the language to actually pull the status quo to the center. So let's spend the evening looking at the slut walks, particularly the one that took place this past weekend in DC, and discuss the pros and cons of its activism. Um, so well, here in DC, I mean, obviously some other slut walks have more actively made reclaiming the word slut part of their, I guess, their goal. And that was something that we kind of I guess didn't necessarily address head on. Um, we were just trying to bring together a group of completely different people from all different walks of life under this banner of slut to say, you know, either none of us are sluts or we're all sluts. Who cares? That has nothing to do with sexual assault. And I think that, especially with the term slut, coming from sort of just a younger 20s sort of generation, I feel like just seeing the way that slut is used even in middle school i mean i remember being 11 years old and hearing that one of the girls in my class gave somebody else oral sex 
big slut, big, big slut. Like, she was, you know, 13 years old and just big slut. I can't believe that she did that. And it was kind of like, well, you know, that's... It, it, just, it was baseless. She had one, you know, one sexual experience that people happened to hear about, and it wasn't even sex, and she was a slut. Or, you know, I have, I've had friends who broke up with a guy, and he started dating somebody a week later. Slut. She's the slut. The girl that he's dating now after breaking up with my friend is the slut. Or, you know, she's too pretty. Slut. Or look at that girl walking down the street, you know, with her pretty dress on. Slut. And I think that, like... You know, like we were saying earlier, slut is just, it's such a baseless term and it's thrown around with absolutely no meaning. There's no criteria for what somebody can be called a slut for that we really just wanted to say this term is so up in the air and it's used for so many different reasons and only to hurt. Like, let's just stop it. Let, let's just stop calling each other names. Let's stop letting this hurt us and just move forward and say that it has absolutely nothing to do with sexual assault. And so that was just from, from here in DC, that was just sort of the perspective that we were coming from where it's, you know, it's a baseless term and if we just hold this baseless term over all these different people's heads, it just sort of shows the ridiculousness of the word. Well, can I? Oh, oh sorry. Do you want oh, to go ahead. I was gonna say, I, I don't think that it is a baseless term. I, I do think that, that slut is a very powerful term. And I, I think that it is just because it's thrown around as um, identity markers for a variety of different things that are things and people and, and relationships. Um, I do think that we do have to be careful in the way that we frame um, the language because this eventually all becomes a semantics war. I mean, many of us are uh, understand that the power of language really can move um, social movements e this way, that way. Um, and so I do think that, that we can't say just that, that there is no meaning to that word slut. I, I think that there is a very strong meaning to that word and has many different definitions depending on which communities you come from, how you identify with it, whether you are a survivor, whether you're not a survivor. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily based on age. Um, I just think that it is, it's, it's a commonly used word that it's, it's very derogatory and it's very hateful. And I, and I, you know, I, I would push us to think more strategically around how do words empower or disempower us as a community, as um, survivors of sexual assault, as activists, whatever. Um, but I, 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 I just want to make that claim that I, I don't, I don't think that we can just say it's not, it, it, it has no meaning because there clearly is a meaning, um, either positive or negative, depending on on where you stand. So I'm going to say that I live in a household with two lesbians and four dogs, and every day I use the word B. Every day I say the D word, as you see my girlfriend shaking her head very fervently. I use the word B, I say dyke, I use the N word. Um, I use MF very frequently. In fact, I have coined the term MFing, MFer. That is my line. I say it on a regular basis. Some of you are red faced right now. That's why you don't live with us. But, <laughs> but. I have to be honest and say, again, I come from the place that everyone should know their own power. And we live in a society that is systematically structured so that we do not know our own power. Therefore, one four-letter word could change our whole lives. There's not, well, okay, I'm about to lie. I have anger management problems, so there are some <laughs> things you can say to me that will get your head knocked off your shoulders. But I am aware of my strength. And I will look at you if I decide not to knock your head off your shoulders and say, I'm not going to let the devil use me, and then call you an mf and mf -er all the rest of the day. So I say that to say, when, when we get into these words, and when we get into marketing, and when we get to all that other stuff, it's OK for a woman to be scantily clad you know, to sell makeup. What do her areolas have to do with her face? But you know, 
it, it, it's, it's totally horrible for these group of women who have been violated or who support those who have been violated to take this term and, and take away the power from the assailant and give it back to the victim. Again, I say it, it's about cultivating conversations so that those individuals who come from the mind frame of a feminist who's worked with all the women organizations who's in their 40-somethings can, can, can come to someone who's here in their mid-20s and say, you know, you don't agree. Most of our activists don't make it. There are some who could have been activists who committed suicide because of them dealing with their experience as a survivor of sexual abuse. There are some who are lesbians, who are gay, who committed suicide because they couldn't deal with the reality of what they really were. Not because of who they were and knowing their own power, but because of a word. So with that being said, I understand where you come from, from the standpoint of hate crimes. But I come from a standpoint of we've got to come to a place where we are empowering ourselves in these kind of community forums as based off a slut walk with the big old S-L-U-T word is what got us here. So I'd say it was rather successful. <laughs> well, as a male survivor, so to speak, um, what I came, what I uh, took from this was um, more of, of kind of an allegiance kind of um, attitude, um, empowering to men as well, because men are also victims. And as you all know, men are also perpetrators. So I think that it's very essential that men um, that are involved um, basically take away the fact that we are, most men are, are perpetrators. Therefore, we need to form an alliance with women to try to strike back and take back, you know, essentially, you know, what is happening to women and men. Um, it's not so much happening to men as, as much, but as, as a survivor, you know, what I got from this is that it, it was very empowering and it was something that, you know, I left with, you know, the knowledge and basis to move forward instead of like sitting there, you know, being like, what do I do next? You know, this was something that, that actually moved me in a way that I know what to do now. So I can honestly say, I guess for your answer is that men can take away empowerment as well as women. I wanted to piggyback. Um, there's a gentleman that I met given the work with the Slut Walk by the name of Ben Privet. And his life's work is he runs an organization called the Consensual Project. And he and I joke because I say, oh, you teach guys how to get laid, which is totally not the truth. But he teaches the importance of consent in any form, specifically sexual form. Um, I want to highlight, while we've talked about sluts and, and, and you know women empowering and what women wear, there are young children who oftentimes are males who in their own churches or places of worship have been assaulted. So where else could you be more innocent and pure than to go to a place of worship and then to be assaulted? So I don't want to say that we should say men should not be assaulters or men should. We should say that this happens to all of us. And we should walk away using my favorite term, collectively oppressed. And when a lady comes to you and she's like, you don't get slut walks because you're a guy, you hit her up and you say, we're all collectively oppressed. Because I'm quite sure, you know, you deal with a lot of things. Being a man, you should be a little hard. Or if you dress too cute, you're metrosexual. Or if, you know, just so many things that are put out there that are just so asinine. Because one of the things Andrea said, and I, I keep referring to her because I just think she's brilliant, is that we like to create a us and a them. So that we in the us don't have to deal with them. And we can further separate ourselves instead of coming together and realizing that we're really closer than we really are. There's no difference between you and I, except for that you have a penis. And if you know anything about lesbians, I'll leave that alone. But um, I just say that men should take away that they are part of this community as well, and that they are victims, they are survivors, they are perpetrators, but we all need each other. And I need you just as much as I need you. You get the point. And, and there's a great organization out there called Men Could Stop Rape who does, they do a lot of this type of work. Um, and I think if you are interested, that would be a really great way to hook up and figure out how can I as a male actually find respect? Like what, what does that mean? Um, how do I dialogue around this issue with my own peers? Because, you know, we know that, that just like it is amongst the f female crew, with the male crew, you often are influenced by your peers, you know? So if your peers are telling you that's disrespectful, you're probably gonna listen to them. 
Um, and so, you know, Men Can Stop Rape, I just want to do a plug for them because they, they really are that organization, I think, that really is, is trying to do that shift of what can males do to take accountability for their actions but also address um, the larger spectrum of this is the way that, that we've been socialized, you know, so how do I, how do I deconstruct that and renew and create a new definition for our community of what masculinity is and what is femininity as well.